for us to begin. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Central Asia Program online seminar at the George Washington University. We have been doing a lot of book launches since January, and today we are really happy to receive uh, uh, Scott Levy for his last uh, book, The Bukharan Crisis, A Connected History of 18th Century Central Asia, that was published last year at Pittsburgh University Press. Scott is a professor of Central Asian history at the Ohio State University, where he serves as chair of the Department of History and interim chair at the, of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. And Scott already published a few years ago a great book called The Rise and Fall of Kokand, Central Asia in the Global Age, and he's continuing his analysis of Central Asia at the 18th century with this new uh, book on the Bukharan crisis. And it's really, I mean, we have very few historian working on kind of pre-Russian colonization period of Central Asia. And I really are very happy that Scott is with us today also to put Central Asia back into the, the kind of global history and show how much the regions is telling us a lot about the, the kind of modern uh, Eurasian and world uh, history. And with us today, we also have Christopher Atwood, who is professor in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilization at the University of Pennsylvania, where he teaches the history of Mongolia and the inner Asian borderlands of China. And uh, Chris has kindly agreed to be the, the discussant or almost the interviewer of Scott to uh, make a very lively discussion about this really, uh, uh, really important book. So welcome, uh, everybody. I will first give the floor to Christopher to lead the conversation with Scott about the book, and then we will open the floor for Q&A. So in, I invite you to ask your question in the chat box, and I will moderate the discussion in the second half of the, the, the time we, we have for us today. So once again, welcome, Scott and Chris. Chris, I give you the floor. Thank you, Marlene. Great. I'm uh, really happy to be here and um, happy to talk with Scott because the book is so interesting. So the first thing I want to ask ask you, Scott, is what got you interested in this project, the Baharan crisis and connecting the history of 18th century Central, Central Asia? Well, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and thank you, Marlene. And I, I'd like actually to thank the entire audience uh, as well. It looks like we've got about 84 people who are here right now. And I know at this time of the year, we are all zoomed out. We have been spending so much time in front of our computers. I really appreciate the fact that you're taking a little bit more time to, to spend in front of the computer to, to hear about this, this book. Uh, I appreciate your interest, so thank you all. Um, and Chris, in, in, in response to your question, um, what got me into this project? I mean, really, this kind of started as my career began, uh, and this is back in the 90s with my first project on the Indian merchant diaspora that extended its interests into Central Asia in the middle of the 16th century, flourished through the 17th century, persisted to the 19th century. And that study, I mean, that, that, that diaspora rose, flourished and collapsed at a point in time when the historiography uh, suggested that India and Central Asia would be growing farther apart. So it kind of put that whole historic, historical tradition on its head. So I started kind of thinking about approaching Central Asia in different ways, in ways that were more connected to world history back then. I mean, even as I was working on that as my dissertation back in the 90s. But really, what this, this project emerged out of the Hokan book. As I was starting to write The Rise of the Khanate of Hokan, which uh, dates back to the very beginning of the 18th century, 1709, I mean, it's emerging it's at the exact time that Bukhara is suffering this terrible crisis. And as I was writing The Rise of Hokand, I realized I needed to create a little bit of context so that my readers would understand what was happening. Uh, why was it that, you know, Hokan was emerging in the, in, in, in the beginning of the 18th century? So I started with, you know, peppering a few discussions here and there uh, in, in, in the early chapters. And then that actually emerged into, it grew into its first, an entire chapter, then two chapters, and then it was a separate part of the book. And then I just decided, look, these are really two different books. They've okay. got to be separated out. Uh, so that's, it, you know, it, long and short of it, that's where, 
where the, the book came out of. <laughs> That's really interesting. It reminds me of what my, um, uh, my dissertation director said, which is, you know, if you're writing your dissertation, George Carr said, you write your dissertation, write the, the part you really want to write first, because if you start with the introduction, the introduction will turn into something else and you'll never get to the main <laughs> thing. So you did it smart. You stuck with Hokan first for the main thing. Then you turned it into another book. So that was a great, um, uh, that was that was a good strategy. I hope you probably yeah. can use that story for your, um, to uh, guide your graduate students. Yeah, um, of course they came out in reverse order though, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, the the context came out three years after the, the Hokan book, but, you know, well, now that they're both out, we can, you can read them however you like. Yeah, in some ways, yeah. you know, solution to the crisis comes out before the crisis. Uh, right. <laughs> in some ways. Um, now, so it, there's a lot about the Silk Road in here, and you have a really, I think it's going to be a lot of graduate students are going to be reading this chapter as like, oh man, my qualifying exams are coming up, I'm going to be asked about the Silk Road, I got to get the summary, and <laughs> Scott Levi's going to give me the whole picture about the Silk Road. So tell me, why was it so necessary to engage with the Silk Road? What was it, what were some of the, the strengths of the Silk Road paradigm and sort of previous scholarship, but what were also some of the problems that you've had? Had with the previous scholarship on the Silk Road that sure. made you need to engage it. Sure. So the Silk Road, of course, is it's a scholarly creation, right? Nobody ever has said in, in history, you know, bye, honey, um, I'm, I'm heading out on the Silk Road. I'll be back <laughs> in three years. You know, I'm going to run <laughs> off to the Mediterranean and and, and such. You know, it, and we date it back to, uh, of course, Ferdinand von Richthofen in 1877. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a scholarly creation. It remains very popular and very important as it's used as a tool for creating historical arguments. It's commonly used as a shorthand to refer to all overland trade through Central Asia. And my big problem, I have several problems with it, and, and many of us historians who are working with, with Eurasian commercial history in one way or another, we've got problems with the model. But my central problem is that in this framework, Central Asia exists primarily to mediate China's westward trade. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who work on Central Asia, we recognize this is, this is a fraction of what Central Asia's commercial connectivity was all about. But we're left with this Sinocentric distortion of Central Asian history. And that distortion gets folded into all sorts of arguments that have nothing to do with commercial history, but it's built into this understanding of Central Asian history. So the Silk Road itself, what we understand about it, I argue and try and demonstrate in, in, in chapters two and three, that it's, it's poorly defined, it's overly malleable, it can be twisted and molded like Play-Doh into whatever anybody wants to support any sort of an argument. And I survey a few examples in chapter three. Uh, these are largely based on assumption, not evidence. Mm -hmm. So I'm arguing in chapter three that we need to move beyond those assumptions and examine the actual evidence. Mm -hmm. Then we start to build something that's more comprehensive, more historically accurate. And what we end up seeing, as, as I, I try and demonstrate again in, in chapter three, is that instead of an abrupt break in the 16th century, we see more continuity into the early modern era with some really interesting twists, right? So some, some new elements of, of this commercial connectivity that are driving um, uh, Eurasian history as we move from the 16th century forward into the modern era. Well, okay, so 16th century, I mean, this is the time, I mean, I think probably everyone who is on a faculty and has said at some point, um, uh, once Vasco da Gama circled around Africa, uh, the Silk Road was no longer needed to, because everybody knows it's cheaper to move things by sea than by land, so the Silk Road disappears. So um, uh, that, that argument makes a big appearance in your book, and you, you don't treat it very gently. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so um, just tell us a little bit of how does that argument and that, that idea, how does that work with the Silk Road concept to, to to create mis misapprehensions about Central, Central Asia? So I, I spend a fair amount of effort trying to examine scholarship from you know, the last several decades that have really tried to, essentially they've exploded that idea that the European activities in the Indian Ocean uh, somehow led to a, a deterioration of Central Asia's connectivity. Right, um, And there are a number of factors. One is that the European activities in the Indian Ocean were primarily moving Asian merchandise from one Asian port to another Asian mm -hmm. port. You know, moving merchandise to Europe was a, just a small part of, of, of their, their, their activities. 
But um, uh, when I'm thinking about um, uh, the distinctiveness of what the Silk Road is all about, it is, um, I'm, I'm trying to argue for, as I said, kind of a more holistic understanding. So looking at what, uh, of course, you know, you've got your small time peddlers who are moving merchandise from one location to another location, but you've got all sorts of different groups, multiple merchant diasporas overlapping with each other. You've got uh, interests coming from Russia, from China and from India that are extending into Central Asia. And then you've got Central Asian merchant diasporas that are extending outward. Yeah. So, and all of this is happening within the, 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 the frameworks of the, the early modern period. So, you know, I would say, if I were to say what's distinctive about the early modern Silk Road, you know, on the one hand, you've got these commercial groups from the periphery, you've got Central Asian commercial groups extending outward. Um, mm -hmm. Central Asia remained a Eurasian hub for a vibrant transit trade and a great variety of merchandise. Um, uh, there's compelling evidence suggesting an upward trajectory in some area in some areas. Um, as, it, as a whole, it illustrates that Central Asia was not isolated prior to the Russian colonial period. You've got um, processes connecting it to the maritime world, movements of new technologies that are also shaping Central Asian history, mm -hmm. agricultural developments happening within Central Asia, mm -hmm. new crops, cash crops for export, I could go on. Right, yeah, and, and, and of course, a lot of that story of the flourishing, particularly in the late 18th century, is the, um, that's the, the story of the Hokan book. So uh, those who wanna hear more about flourishing cash crops and things like that in the Fargana Valley, they need to buy also your, Hoka, your Hokan book, <laughs> as well as your Bahara Crisis book. But now you talked about early modern. And early modern is a, uh, it's a controversial concept. It's a big concept. What's like the Silk Road, it's one of those big ideas uh, that people use to talk about global history. They use to, to shape global history. And once again, you've got another great, um, you know, um, graduate students taking their qualifying exams will be thanking you uh, for many, many years to come uh, for giving a nice summary of some of the scholarly debates about uh, the early modern period. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about, um, about the early modern concept as you see it, what are some of the controversies, how do you situ situate yourself within it, and how do you see that being relevant to um, Central Asia? Sure, sure, so that's, that's a great question. Uh, so what does early modern mean, um, uh, and does it mean anything at all in the Central Asian context? Um, you know, early modernity is a, it's a historian's device, right? It's a way to identify a particular period and set that period apart from the period before it, generally speaking, the medieval, and then the period after it, the modern era. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I look at the scholarship in the, um, uh, through the 1990s, um, coming out at, at least in the, in the West, uh, you know, Yuri Bregel uh, defines this period, uh, you know, as we're moving into um, uh, the, the 16th century, it begins the Uzbek period of, right. of Central Asian history. Um, and referring to it as the Uzbek period, that emphasizes the political role of the Uzbeks. Oh, it's a kind of it's, dynastic name, you know, like yeah, you know, yeah. the Ming it's Dynasty not, or the, you know, the Mughal period, something like that. Yeah, that's right. And there's nothing objectionable about that. You know, it's, um, it focuses attention on politics in the state. There's not, he's not, I'm not saying that he was wrong to do so, but it's, it's a way to direct attention to, to politics in the state. Uh, it emphasizes the Uzbek tribal dynasties of the 18th century, moving into the 19th century. Um, and then you view the, the territory as politically fragmented. Um, early modern is a different way of looking at uh, roughly the same period, uh, but it's a way that I, I, I prefer because it highlights the connectivity. Mm. So we, er, the, the concept of early modernity begins in European history as a part of a discussion surrounding what becomes modern Europe, right? It's a social science framework a, a, you know, that creates a model for what becomes modern. So you see centralizing states, there's a, a unilineal kind of a development. Uh, and then Jack Goldstone um, uh, uh, wrote a, a, a scathing critique of it, uh, poorly applicable within Europe, completely inapplicable beyond Europe. But as Goldstone was writing that critique, right, really taking to task the, the whole idea and its, its applicability, 
uh, world historians took hold of the term and started to apply it in a, in, a, in a way that was both broader and more flexible. And here I'm looking at Sanjay Subramaniam, uh, Jerry Bentley especially, right. uh, more recent work by Victor Lieberman of Michigan, right. um, and then John Richards writing out of South Asian history like, like Sanjay. Right. So here we, we see a number of defining features that can be examined on, on a global scale. And they all center on connectivity. So economic impact of silver circulation, um, uh, the agricultural transformation, some of which I was just referring to that I explore in the Central Asian context, right. labor markets, expansion of slavery, population growth generally due to improvements in nutrition, due to new, new world crops, uh, competition for resources that spurs technological advancements, especially in the military world. And then of course the, the military revolution. And here I have to tip my hat to my colleague at, at Ohio State, Jeffrey Parker, who wrote a book titled The Military Revolution. Right? So these are all kinds of frameworks. Joseph Fletcher was writing about this right when, when he passed away right. at far too young an age back in the early 80s. And then it was kind of dropped for Central Asia. So to answer your question, where do I see myself? I'm trying to kind of pick up where Fletcher left off, but take stock of all of these incredible achievements that right. scholars working in other parts of the world have been making and bring that back to Central Asia. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so there's so many great books you just listed by name. So uh, yeah, graduate students, take note, read them all. Um, <laughs> after you read Scott's book. All right, let's turn to the Baharan Crisis. Um, okay. You know, that's the, the title of the book is The Baharan Crisis. So tell me, what was the Baharan Crisis? Okay. Why was so, it a crisis? What, what, what was the Baharan Crisis? So we can describe this crisis in pretty high definition. There's a fair amount of work that's been done um, that examines various aspects of this crisis. So diminished power vis-a-vis -vis the state's neighbors, right? The Bukharan Khanate centered in Bukhara, second city was Balkh in, in Northern Afghanistan. Um, you know, Yuri uh, Bregel had written about the, the, this particular, as have others, right? Economic problems leading to currency debasement. Uh, Elena Davidovich was writing about this um, uh, and, and did some really I interesting numismatic uh, studies. And I examined that and, and you know, kind of chart out that, that debasement. Um, the uh, Kazakh and Jungar invasions of the first half of the 18th century. Uh, Michael Hancock Palmer just wrote a great dissertation on historical memories of the, the barefoot flight, right? Um, uh, the depopulation of Samarkand, um, uh, Basembiev uh, wrote about that. Loss of legitimacy in the eyes of the Uzbek tribes, Robert McChesney and Ron Silla have both written on this. And then it was brought to an end, the, the Khanate itself, in the wake of uh, Nadir Shah's invasions, uh, first in 1737 and then 1740. For those who and, might not know, do you want to, is this Nadir Shah, would it identify oh, yeah, him a yeah, little bit? Sorry, Turkmen uh, commander in the, the Safavid army, who once the Safavids are, are, are defeated, he takes over and ushers in the Afshar, you know, short-lived and um, uh, not very, uh, fondly remembered of Shara dynasty in, in Persian history. Right. So you've got the, the, the Persian armies under, under Nadir Shah, well, under his son and then under himself in 1737 and 1740 that occupy um, Bukhara. And it's, so yeah, from the, the perspective of the Bukharan Ark, the great Ark in Bukhara, it was yeah. pretty bleak. But what I noted is that we could dis, dis, define or do we describe this, def, the, the, this crisis? But we have come no closer to identifying the causal factors that underpinned it. Right. We were still left with the same old explanation, collapse of the Silk Road, or if you don't want to talk about the Silk Road, growing isolation from Eurasian right. trade routes. If we want to talk about it right. in more abstract terms, that's fine. Right. Um, and it, the idea is that it was, you know, all of this was propelled by the movement of transcontinental trade right. from overland routes to maritime routes. And that's the only explanation that I'd seen. Right. And I wanted to examine what actually caused this crisis. It just Why also did it occur? No, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Just um, so yeah, so I just wanted to um, um, uh, one thing also the Baharan Ark. Um, you know, maybe for th those of people that's the citadel of Bukhara, right? The, yep. yep. Yeah. That's right. That's right. For those who might be not be familiar. Um, so in the, in the end, you talk about so we you you throw out the old explanation. The old explanation is that you know after the Europeans circle around the Cape of uh, 
Good Hope and uh, enter the Indian Ocean. They siphon all the trade away from the land routes and it starts taking the sea routes. And therefore, Bihar becomes isolated and it loses. It's no longer connected. And so they don't get any money from the Silk Road anymore. Okay, let's throw that explanation out. You've totally trashed it. And um, I think uh, if, you know, that, that will be something that really is going to change uh, how we teach this period. In the end, then, what do you conclude was the major reasons behind this, this crisis? Great. So um, uh, that's chapter four. Right. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about pretty, chapter four. Pretty, pretty, pretty big chapter. Um, there's no one, uh, one cause. There's, um, I, I try to produce what um, my colleague uh, at, at um, Georgetown, Jim Miller, has called a braided explanation. Right. Multiple factors converging, some moving relatively slowly, some up, happening pretty abruptly, but all converging in the first half of the 18th century to the great detriment of the Bukharan Khanate and all who were dependent upon the, mm. those state structures. So let me just br very briefly mention um, uh, five, and I'm happy to talk about the, them in, in, in greater detail. Sure. One factor is um, underlying structural problems that are, are, are inherent in the Bukharan political system dating back even to the 16th and 17th century. And here I'm talking about the appendage system. The royal family's fundamentally decentralized method of shared governance. It was mm -hmm. fundamentally decentralized. There were earlier efforts to reform it and to centralize, mimicking efforts that were successful in the Ottoman Empire, the Mughal Empire, for example, but those mm -hmm. failed. So we have in place a highly decentralized system. Second, and this I think is actually a pretty minor factor, but the political crises that unfolded in Mughal India and Safavid Iran. Uh, Mughals following the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, Safavids following the um, Gilzai um, uh, uh, Afghan uh, occupation of Isfahan, a deterioration of Safavid authority. Uh, so there's a one could argue a dislocation of connections uh, from Central Asia to the Indian Ocean in that period. Now, right. the reason I think it's relatively minor is, um, one is there's no, I've, I've found no documentary evidence demonstrating that the Indian merchants that were occupied or that were operating in Central Asia in the 17 teens, 20s, 30s, that they suffered any sort of, of, of hardship. Right. Second is because we actually see an increase evidence of an increase in external trade with Russia and China at the same time. I see. Right. Third, and now we're getting into some of the more substantial problems, is the environmental crisis of the 17th century. So environmental history plays a very large role in my argument. Um, and here we're talking about the period that environmental historians refer to as the Little Ice Age. The long 17th century, an extended period of, um, uh, of, of cooling. So crazy weather patterns, changing um, uh, what was kind of standard uh, weather patterns in, in, in Central Asia. Uh, exceptionally cold and wet in Central Asia. So late frosts, early freezes, leading to failed harvests, famine, rebellion. And these exacerbate these decentralized tendencies uh, that are already kind of baked into the Bukharan political system. I spend a fair amount of time trying to introduce the science of, right. uh, of, of, of the environmental crisis. But uh, uh, like I said, I'm happy to answer questions about that, but I don't want right. to just focus on that for the next half hour. Um, then we see a monetary crisis. And here I look to Elena Davidovich's work. Um, this monetary crisis was pretty bad over the course of the 17th century, but it became absolutely severe in the first half of the 18th century. And the interesting thing is that I can trace the severity of in the, in the first half of the 18th century to developments happening in Qing China. This uh, is the, the, the debasement, the complete debasement of, of Bukharan uh, coinage down to a point where it's I think 9% silver, uh, yeah. which is you know, abysmally low. Um, this is happening as the demand for silver in China is um, what uh, Richard Van Glan, uh, a Chinese economic historian, refer refers to as voracious, this voracious right. demand. So silver has an increased uh, purchasing power in Qing China. And that's also related to the environmental history framework. Right. As China is 
pummeled in the 17th century. This is part of the story of the end of the Ming rise of the right, Qing. Right. And then from 1700 to 1750, the first half of the 18th century, the Qing population doubles. Right. right? It's, you know, it, it's growing at, at, at an extraordinary rate. And you just see the, the silver flowing out of Central Asia and into those markets. Right. And then the, finally is um, a military component, uh, military technology relating to the, the, the gunpowder revolution. And here we've got um, uh, Central Asian states who of course had long depended, you know, for, for millennia had depended upon um, uh, nomadic uh, military strategies. Right. They resisted gunpowder weapons as long as they could. But in the late 17th, beginning of the 18th century, there's a technological innovation that they could no longer ignore. And that's the, the flintlock musket, All right. uh, which increases the utility of these muskets by a factor of three. Right. So, so now they're better the than to the flintlock. So now these ri these rifles can really compete against the archery and you know, in, in that's right. They couldn't before. Yeah. Over the 17th century, there was more or less parity between nomadic archers and um, and infantry soldiers. Mm -hmm. But once you've got the flintlock, uh, that parity is broken. Right. And in the first half of the 18th century, states like the Bukharan Khanate could no longer avoid it, and they tried to then bring in. Uh, and uh, Wolfgang Holsworth has written some great work on this. Right. Uh, they try to bring in um, the, the Bukharan Khans do, um, slave soldiers armed with flintlock muskets, but they don't have the resources. It's too little, too late. Right. And when the, the uh, Nadir Shah's troops, when the Persians invade, it's done. That's yeah. it. So yeah. that's, the, that's the explanation. Like all of these kind of braided together. Right. So very multi-causal and also brings in, again, the connectivity, um, the connectivity issues and some brief limited interruptions in connectivity, perhaps due to these political crises we talked about in, in Mughal, India and in Safavid, Iran. Um, right. That's there's right. so many things I could ask, but in, in just in the interest of time, um, what I want to ask you, what's, you know, uh, were there some sort of false leads that you you encountered in the course of writing this book? Some things you thought, oh, I thought that would be the explanation, but it turns out not to be. Yeah, yeah. So I went in with a number of hypotheses. Um, uh, one, I mean, I, I suspected that um, the military revolution was going to play a role. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, when I found out, when I learned more about the flintlock musket, that really opened my eyes to it. Right. But one false lead really specifically has to do with climate crisis. Right. So my department, uh, the history department at Ohio State, um, is a, it's a great center for environmental history. I've got eight colleagues who identify as environmental historians working on all sorts of different areas. Um, and so I've, I, I learned quite a bit I, I, through osmosis, right? right? Attending talks, listening to book talks, talking right. with my colleagues. Um, I expected to find, as I started learning um, uh, the ins and outs of environmental history, I expected to find that the, the climate crisis undermined the Bukharan state in the 18th century, that somehow or other this little ice age extended in, into the 18th century. Right. And that, that explained the, the, why, the, why, right. why the, the Bukharan crisis became so critical toward the end. Right. But that, that yeah, chronology is a little off, right? Normally we think of the, little, the, the, the worst period is kind of the middle of the 17th century, something like that, right? Yeah, and the science suggested that my hypothesis was completely wrong. Right. The science for, yeah, and we've got a, a, we had two separate teams that were doing, um, uh, uh, they were doing tree, core, or tree, sample, tree ring analyses and then ice core samples, right. uh, some in Xinjiang and some in Harazm. And the evidence suggests that what's true for the rest of the Northern hemisphere is true for Central Asia, that by the mm. time you get into the 1720s, uh, we're out of the Little Ice Age and back into what's called a relatively normal climatic pattern. Right. So I had to rethink my assumptions. And what in, in the end, I think it's, it's helped me create a more accurate explanation for right. the, the crisis, right? We see a layered understanding of how the 17th century Christ put the Bukharan Khanate into a, um, uh, on, on a decentralizing pattern. Right. And then other factors ensured that the decentralizing pattern continued into the 18th century. 
Right. In, in, in a way, we could say also in some ways the recovery, because the recovery was also ha- in, the, in, the, in the early 18th century, it was happening in China. So that creates this you know, demand for silver and so on. So then we create the, the silver then is moving out of Central Asia into, into, into the uh, early Qing and, and, and therefore um, uh, creating that, um, uh, the monetary crisis that you talked about in, 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 in Bukhara, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, one of the great ironies, I think, is um, uh, Nadir Shah, uh, you know, invades Delhi, sacks Delhi, and opens up the treasury. Yeah. And part of what brings the crisis, there are several factors that cause the crisis, and there are several factors that bring the crisis to an end. Yeah. And one of these is the sudden circulation of enormous amounts of, of, of silver rupees right. that start from the, you know, the, right. you get into the 1740s. But again, that's too late for the Bukhar and Khans at that point in time. Right. The state was really, it was already cooked by that point. But, and that's then, and then the, 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 the political entity that it kind of picks up on that rise in late 18th century thing is Hokan, not yeah. Bukhara, right? That's right, that's right. right. That's right. Then we get into the Hokan story and we start to see how right. cash crop production, increasing irrigation agriculture in the Fargana Valley, you know, exploiting the natural resources of the Fargana Valley, which right. if you haven't been, oh my God, you should go. It's so right. beautiful. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but right. you see this, this extraordinary productivity unfold, um, you know, as we're moving from really from the later in the 18th century through the 19th century. Right. Great. So I want to turn a little bit about, okay, so um, I think it's a really great explanation. And I think uh, for those of you, who, you know, beginning in the study history of Central Asia, you've got a really great explanation of what was going on in the late 17th, early 18th centuries. Okay, I, I, as students reading this book, um, what are some kind of lessons, some ideas, some areas of study that you might hope that you're hoping might they might be inspired to work on um, or inspired to read more about and study more about? Good question. Um, I'm going to say two things. Um, one is what, what I hope students get from this is, um, so the, the Hokan book is based primarily on my work with Central Asian primary sources or Central Asian, I should say Central Asian literature, right? The Chronicles of Hokan, you know, written largely in Persian, but also in Turkic. Um, this book, the Bukharan Crisis book is a lar- it's largely, uh, it's historiographical, okay? But in terms of a methodology, what I am arguing for, uh, you know, throughout both of these books is uh, to co- combine close, careful source-based analysis, right? The re- research of the primary sources, combine that with big scholarly thinking, right? right. Stay, staying aware of what scholars are, are trying to, to argue in other fields, advancements in other fields, um, you know, the, the Bukharan crisis book is really concerned with those bigger questions, but I, I, uh, I'm an advocate for combining both of these, right. right? You know, do that close, you know, real, what, what Joseph Fletcher called that vertical work in the, in the sources in a particular area. Right. Um, but also think horizontally because yes. the people who are living in the 18th century or the 8th century, right, they're living in a location, they're living in a historical moment. But they're also, we have to give them credit for being aware and interested in what's happening beyond them, yeah. uh, beyond their, their particular areas. Yeah. Second, uh, I would say um, I, I, want, I want students to, to come out of this, you know, recognizing the incredible value uh, that studying Central Asian history has for, for, for scholarship, right? Mm-hmm. It's, you know, of course this is true in, in, in you know, our contemporary period, but it's, it's also, it's just as true um, uh, historically. My audience with this book is scholars and students, including undergraduates um, yeah. who are studying Eurasian history, right, yeah. writ large. And Central, it's, it, Central Asia provides an incredible canvas for, for yeah. historical scholarship. We connect Russia, China, India, the Middle East. Yeah. We can provide a counterpoint to those narratives, but we've got to be aware of those narratives as, as we're yeah. doing that. We can, you know, we, I, I tend to work on social economic history, but we've got religion, art, literature, science, philosophy. We can work on nomads, nomadic empires, nomadic and sedentary state interactions, conflicts, all sorts of thema- okay. thematic frameworks, and you know, tons of really great questions that are just waiting right. to be explored. Right. right, and and of course, uh, one of the things is that you have the environmental history and the military history also, which you know, as you t- talked about, your colleagues at OSU have been um, uh, 
really instrumental in, in yeah. sort of opening your mind about those. Um, yeah. What's your next book? Tell us about your next book. Oh man, I would love to. I would love to do a cookbook. <laughs> I, love to, I, I love Central Asian cuisine. I would love to do like a, a okay. historical Central Asian cookbook. Um, you know, okay. historical, you know, kumis, kurut, lahman, plov. I, you know, that's gonna, <laughs> right. going to have to wait just a little bit. Um, I've, I've, I'm working on two things right now. Um, uh, then maybe I'll get to the cookbook. Uh, one is the Oxford Research Encyclopedia for Asian Commercial History. So right. this is, I'm, I'm editor in chief for this project. I've got seven editors. Um, it's, we're, we're looking at about 120 essays, about a million words that are all together. I mean, from antiquity to the contemporary period, trying to present your, your Asian, right? I'm really Asian, uh, commercial history in, 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 you know, the work that's most cutting edge. And some of this emerges from my dissatisfaction with the ways that we've treated the Silk Road. Right. right. If it's so overly malleable, if it's so poorly researched, I want us to be able to start talking about things based on you know, evidence based research. What we, right. So we could talk about the role that nomads played in Eurasian connectivity and, and the roles that various merchant groups and this this kind of thing. But I want to do it writ large again, um, you know, all of uh, all, all of Asia. So that's that's one project. And I'd right. say it's about halfway there. Um, right. Another two to three years. And we should be ready to go to right. print. That's great. Great. The other one is um, uh, a, a, a pretty ambitious study of early modern Central Asia uh, from the, um, uh, we'll say from the, the, the Mongol Empire, right, once the empire is established, right. um, up to the colonial period. And again, I want to try and connect research, connect events that are happening in, in, in the region. Uh, right. to the great achievements that are happening in, in, in all of the, the various fields that Central Asia connects with. Right. So um, that's going to be a pretty ambitious one. I've, I've, I've right. been outlining it. The, I think the outline's are already up to about 12 pages. So kind of from the Chagatai to the Tsar, something like yeah, that. That's, yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, something like that's that. Right. Great. Well, I think that will, people will really, will, will really be looking forward to that. Now, so... Uh, you know, is there some relevance for Central Asia today in your book? I mean, I remember um, he, it, your argument reminds me kind of of, of uh, the argument that, uh, I mean, Alex Cooley and John Hedeshaw make that we think of Central Asia today as its problems come because it's very isolated. And his argument is, th their argument is not, no, it's coming because it's connected, but it's connected in very, in very dysfunctional ways. I mean, every, you know, all, all the money's getting stashed in Swiss bank accounts. And so, you know, right, in some right. ways they're, they're more connected to banking and other kinds of, of, of networks outside of Central Asia than they are to what's going on in Central Asia. Is there, is there some, Connectivity isn't a big issue. Is that somehow relevant? Is your story relevant to Central Asia today? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and I'll say in, in, in two ways. One is uh, because history matters, right? Yeah. And this, I mean, for those of us who are in the United States, you know, we have debates about what goes into textbooks for high schools, right? right. How, do we, how do we teach the Civil War? How do we teach plantation slavery? How do we right. teach chattel slavery in, in, in the U.S. history? These are debates that we have because how we teach our students, to our children, to think about the past matters in right. the contemporary period, right? And, you know, as we're standing here in 2021, we can make some pretty clear arguments that it matters, and it matters a lot, right? Um, you know, what questions are we going to center? What narratives are we going to center? So Central Asian history between the Timurids and the Russian conquests has been framed as a period of decline, as a failure. Right. And this failure led to the Russian colonial period, Soviet era. And that history, those centuries of history, is something that happened to Central Asians. Right. So the idea is that the, the conquests were in the inevitable conclusion of Central Asians' backwardness. Right. And I think that's completely wrong. And if we look at Central Asia and compare it to other, um, you know, the Bukharan Khanate, for example, we'll, we'll take that as the example, or Hokand, uh, to, to other states that are um, emerging, rising, um, and, and, and struggling, you know, showing this great resilience uh, on the frontier of these expanding agrarian empires, you see that central, this, this is a story that happens in an awful, across much of the world, right? Across, as as right. we move through the 18th century and into the period of high imperialism. 
uh, you see some incredible successes in Central mm -hmm. Asia in this period. And the Khanate of Hokand is one, right? right? The Fargana Valley, roughly 8,500 square miles, right? By the time we get to the end of the 18th century, Hokand is governing over the entire Fargana Valley. You go forward four decades and it's a, it's a quarter of a million square miles. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's the size of Ukraine. It's huge. Mm. It's expanded into what is today Tajikistan, far up into Kazakhstan. It's um, revolutionized its military. It's, uh, you know, by any measure, that's a highly successful state. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, so, like I said, history matters. Right. So understanding not just the centering that Bukharan crisis and that by the, all of the problems that are associated with it, but looking yeah. at the complexities of Central Asian history in this period, right. that changes the narrative and that changes right. how people understand, you know, what is also contemporary Central Asia. So that's that's right. one. Sorry, it was a long-winded answer for number one. <laughs> right. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> number two is, 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 you know, really more to the point of your question, Central Asia was never disconnected. Right. In the early modern era, as it was in the medieval period and antiquity, you've got sustained efforts to manage external relationships, to acquire knowledge, to acquire technology, wealth and resources, balance those relationships with large peripheral powers, even as the military revolution is tilting the balance in the favor of those large peripheral powers. Um, and try to do that to the advantage of the region and its people. Um, that's hard work. Right. And that's as true as it was in, in the 18th century uh, as it is today. And trying to navigate the, you know, one belt, one road uh, initiative right. and everything that goes with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like in a way, you know, to just to sum up, I mean, it's about crisis, but it's also about resilience. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, if we focus just on that crisis, we've got study after study that's focusing on the crisis. That's the narrative. I, I start the, um, uh, the, the conclusion with a quote uh, from Chimamanda Adichie, the Nigerian novelist, uh, where she's, she did this TED talk back, you know, now it's probably 10 years ago. Right. Uh, and it's the danger of the single story, right? And what I'm saying is, there are many different stories that are unfolding in Central Asia in this period. And we need to decenter that one single story and pay attention to other stories. That's not to say that the Bukharan crisis doesn't merit analysis. It certainly does. Hey, I wrote a book on it. Yeah. <laughs> but, right, right. but that's, there are the, oh, so much more that's happening as well. Uh, and there's an awful lot that we can, we can, we can bring to the, to the discipline uh, if, if, if we start looking more broadly. Yeah, great. Well, I think, I mean, I'm just looking in the chat and I'm seeing a lot of really great questions. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over, turn the mic over to Marlene, who will be fielding the questions and uh, give you more time to talk about really this really, really fascinating book, Scott. Thank you very much, Chris. I really yeah. appreciate the questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, the two of you. It was just a wonderful discussion and I was seeing the question arriving, but I just did not want it to stop the, the discussion between the two of you. Because, <laughs> and in fact, you answered a lot of questions that were also coming in the chat at the at the same time. So thank you so much. The two of you, yeah, they were, they are, there is a lot of uh, uh, questions. Let me give you two or three of them all together and you kind of patch them, uh, match them as you can. Uh, we had a question about the, the kind of religious question in, in uh, Bukhara and the conservative Islamic orthodoxy. Do you think it played a role in refusing financial and technological advancement, irrigation techniques and other technologies needed in the 18th century? So was that, was that the kind of religious component to this, uh, uh, the, the, the situation in, in Bukhara related to technological advancement? And then another question was asking you to give some kind of flesh or color of what it meant for everyday Bukharian to live in this uh, crisis period. How do, you, do we have any uh, uh, historical element that can give us some flesh about how it was for everyday life of the, the, the Bukharian? And we had a question about your cover <laughs> and the, 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 the camel cannon like that you have. And, and so if you could talk a little bit about the kind of the, the, the military technology aspect of that, and that would be your first kind of round of question on very precise points. And then after, if we have time for a second round of question, we'll move to more kind of big meta, meta question or more kind of the region and its global environment aspect. Okay. 
so the let me uh, let me take these on um, uh, the, the in, in order. I've got three questions. Then the first question: Did orthodoxy play a role in the decline? Um, you know, uh, Fred Starr made that argument uh, in his recent book, um, Lost Enlightenment, not about the 18th century, but he, he made that uh, argument as we go back into um, uh, the, the immediate post-Mongol period. And I think, I think it's completely wrongheaded. Uh, I think that um, religion plays a, an increasingly important role in uh, uh, Central Asian political life for purposes of legitimacy as we move it, into the 18th, through the 18th and into the 19th century. Uh, and, you know, here I would point to James Pickett's recent, you know, really great book on, on polymaths. Um, that's, a, that's a great study to, that does a, a wonderful job of analyzing just exactly how that happens. So James Pickett, uh, his, his, his book really addresses that. But, you know, as we're looking at the first half of the 18th century, um, Devin DeWeese actually has an article in Central Asian Survey on um, uh, efforts in uh, Central Asia to try and gather contemporary cutting edge medical knowledge, other, other technological knowledge out from, from outside of the region. Abul Faiz Khan himself is, is cited as, you know, who's, who's he's the last of the, the um, uh, Tokai Timurids uh, to, to, to rule as, as Bukharan Khan, um, you know, with not as a puppet and um uh you know he's he's trying to go out there and, and and gather this new scientific knowledge so i don't see um orthodoxy as as playing a major role uh we also see you know of course the Bukharan merchant families are extending their interests at the same time and many of them were really very religious as well so that's that's connected to some interesting work on on um uh the role of the Bukharans among siberian muslims and and, and, and tatar communities and such um, second, what does it mean for everyday Bukharans to live in this crisis? Uh, in some areas, there is severe hardship, uh, right? We've got, over the course of the 17th century, you've got failed harvests, you've got famines, um, and you've got debasement of coinage, uh, so, which means it's harder to purchase merchandise, commodities, including food, from outside of the region. So those are some serious problems. My point is also at the same time as that, you know, one has to recognize that, that in other areas of Central Asia, the situation wasn't so bad. Um, and here uh, I look at the Fargana Valley again, as we're, we're moving into the 18th century, um, you know, Bukharans, the depopulation of Samarkand, as Samarkand went from being what was, you know, the old Timurid capital, uh, roughly 150,000 people down to just, you know, a, a few thousand people. The city itself in, in, in um, uh, the 1720s was largely depopulated. Uh, many of those people went to the Fargana Valley and they became, their descendants became subjects of the Hokan Khans. So the, as I said, the situation's more complicated. Um, so it depends where you are and when you are, uh, as is the case in, in, in so many crises, right? Um, devastating for some people. Others are able to kind of dodge the worst of it, which was the case in the Fargana Valley, and others show pretty incredible resilience and the ability to adapt and apply new strategies and make their way through the crisis. And then the cover, uh, the camel cannon, this goes the, the Zamburak, uh, or also Shuturnal is another name for it. Uh, it's like a little, it's, the name means wasp, or like a little bee, the you know, fierce little thing that'll sting you and it hurts terribly. Um, that's the, that's the, 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 the pre-modern tank, right? Uh, it'll, it can go across any territory whatsoever. Uh, it's a field cannon strapped to the back of a camel. Um, that particular image, actually, it's a, it's a Persian soldier in the early 19th century. It's, um, uh, but the Zamburak, I mean, the reason why we chose that, uh, one was the, the, uh, editors at, at the press really liked that. And I thought it presented very nicely um, having a Persian soldier targeting off in the distance. In my imagination, he's targeting Bukhara. Uh, you know, it's a few decades later, but um, uh, that was part and parcel of the, the, um, the, the Persians' military advantage. 
the ability to incorporate gunpowder weapons technologies against effectively against uh, a military that was still applying pastoral nomadic uh, strategies. Uh, it tilted the balance in the Persians' favor. And what we see immediately after is um, when the Bukharan Khanate collapses in 1747, uh, Abul Faiz Khan and his son are killed. Um, there's a puppet, uh, Tokai Timur, that's kept until 1785, but the uh, Mangi leadership that takes over, and now we're talking about the Bukharan Emirate, they begin to build a military that mimics that of the Persians, right? So there's a whole new military strategy that is applied from 1747 forward. Um, and it's building on gunpowder weapons technologies such as the, the, the Zamburak. Great, thank you so much for, for trying to summarize all of these questions in, in only a few minutes. So we have time for a second round of questions. Sure. So that, that, that's great. One question is about the role of neighboring countries, so Russia, China, Iran, in, in, uh, in interacting with the region and maybe accelerating or not the crisis. So that's one, and of course, that's kind of part of the big uh, kind of Eurasian connectivity, whatever we want to frame it, uh, question. A great uh, question from our colleague, uh, David Abramson, about like if we want to stop uh, problematizing Central Asia, the kind of e in a narrative of isolation and backwardness and so on, is that a, a shift from a Eurocentric thinking about the region? And so maybe what you are doing with this uh, huge collective work on, on kind of Asian uh, commercial history is part of that. So can we say that there is a kind of shift away from a Eurocentric uh, thinking of Central Asia? Uh, currently happening in the scholarship. And the third uh, question about the title of your book, do you think that by kind of focusing on the notion of crisis, you are kind of uh, taking the risk of having the readers losing the, the, the settings and the successes that also happen in that space? So the fact that it's the title is highlighting the the, the, the crisis or the negative aspect may kind of uh, obscure all the other elements that you are demonstrating in your books in terms of uh, success. So that's the three. And I think with that, we will probably be arriving at the end of the time we have. Sure, sure. So the first is the, the role of neighboring countries. Um, so from the perspective, from the perspective of um, the uh, Persians, uh, I, you know, I, of course, the, the Safavids in 1722 are, are on the way out the door. Uh, and so we really don't see an, an, an awful lot of um, effort coming from Safavid Iran. Uh, what we do see is 1737 is, um, uh, again, uh, the, the Persian invasions. Uh, trying to um, extract whatever wealth they can in the 17 in, in that invasion. In 1740, they come and they don't even take anything. They just leave it all. Of course, they had just been in India, where they they you know it, it extracted enormous amounts of wealth. Um, but what we see from Russia and China, from the perspectives of Russia and China, I think is more interesting. From Russia, we see the establishment of uh, what becomes the Orenburg Line in the first half of the 18th century. And these become uh, locations for, um, I mean, they're not just military outposts, of course, they're locations for commercial activity as well. And so we see that as a great benefit to Central Asian commercial interests, moving merchandise back and forth. Uh, and that starts to be established already in the 1720s, 1730s, we're seeing, you know, and it, as I said, an increase in, action, in, in Central Asian movement northward. But even more important and more direct, following the Qing conquest of what becomes known as Xinjiang, so we're, we're talking Alta Shahara from, from, uh, from the perspective of, of Central Asia, is um, the Qing fiscal policies in Xinjiang following that conquest in 1758-59 involves the steady movement of silver westward from the Qing Eastern Seaboard into Central Asia. 
right? Whereas the story in the first half of the 18th century is the Qing extracting silver from Central Asia. That's reversed as we move into the, um, uh, the second half of the 18th century. That's one of those factors that leads to Central Asia's recovery. And there are a number of reasons why, why the Qing um, uh, decide on, on that particular policy, not least of which is that it's uh, by conquering what becomes known as Xinjiang, it's an extraordinarily large territory and it's much, much easier for the Qing to maintain control, main hold, uh, main, main control over that territory uh, by building uh, a smaller number of garrisons and then helping to build the economy in the region, which is part of their, part, part of their, their, their objective. Um, so I make that argument actually in, um, uh, in the Kokan book. Um, David um, Abramson's point is is right on target. Um, part of what I'm I'm object uh, uh, part of my object objective here is to encourage us as Central Asian historians to stop applying Eurocentric models to Central Asian subjects. At the same time, I'm trying to be very careful not to replace Eurocentric models with Sinocentric models. Right? We don't need to do that in Central Asia. We've got a whole field of Chinese history that's gonna frame their questions with China at the center. That's their job, it's what they do, right? That's, that's the, you know, for us, framing our questions with Central Asia at the center of them makes very good sense. And I think it's also, it does a service to our colleagues who are working in these, as I like to say, these peripheral fields, right? We're in the middle, they're all on the Eurasian periphery. So for once, uh, instead of Central Asia being on China's periphery, they can be on, on ours. Uh, I think that makes a, a very um, important contribution to their ability to think about Central Asian history as, um, you know, a society, group of societies, civilization with agency, with um, uh, with historical actors who are you know three dimensional, motivated by real life problems and trying to come up with real life solutions. So yeah, I mean, David, I think that you're you're right on target there. Uh, and then um, the the title, the the Bukharan crisis. Am I focusing on the negative too much? Um, I think. I, I, I landed on that title. I bounced around a bunch of different titles, but I landed on that one, The Bukharan Crisis, uh, A Connected History of 18th Century Central Asia, because I really want to take ownership over it. You know, the crisis mattered. The crisis, it, it existed. It was a severe crisis, so much so that it ended the Bukharan Khanate. Um, but I really also want it, as I said, this book, is kind of the sister volume. You could say it's kind of a prequel to the Kokan book. Uh, and that Kokan story is also, um, you know, it's the good and the bad. Uh, but I didn't want to back away from the fact that there was this horrible crisis. And the fact is that, you know, what caused the crisis was this issue of, you know, connectivity playing out in ways that um, uh, the, the, the Bukharan leadership was unable to manage. Right? These really large Eurasian world historical processes uh, that um, led into this destabilizing, uh, decentralizing process uh, that, that brought it into the state. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, I, I, as I've said several times now, I also really wanted to draw attention to the, the ways that uh, Central Asian peoples, even in that crisis, were able to chart a course outward, right? Um, whether it's the Bukharan merchants or um, the, the Uzbek Ming in the Fargana Valley or, uh, or, or, or whomever. Uh, so really to complicate it. Complexity, nuance, those are um, absolutely critical to doing good history. Uh, and we, you know, just because we, you know, a crisis is a negative thing, we've got to own that, we've got to understand it, and we need to explain why it happened, and then how it shaped uh, the, the trajectory of, of this region as people charted their way forward. Well, wonderful. I, see, I think, Scott, that, that the perfect conclusion for our <laughs> event, and I wanted to, to thank you for, for being able to answer so many questions, and so, so directly to the point in, in such a a little time and thank you so much Christopher for uh, leading that really great discussion I think everybody enjoyed it uh, uh, very much and, and you can see the, the success there are really a lot of people we serve today so 
Thank you everybody for being here with us today. Stay tuned as we will continue to have a, a discussion on Central Asian history and, and what is happening in the more contemporary space. I wanted to thank you once again, Christopher Scott, for this really wonderful discussion. Scott, congratulations for the book and we are waiting for, for the next ones. That's thank really you, Marlene. Nice. <laughs> thank you, thank you Scott. It's a, beautiful, it's a wonderful book. Everybody go read the thank book. You. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very you much. So much. Yeah, you all be safe and have a nice day. <laughs>